So good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. It's half past one. Welcome back to the ones who had the show in the morning. Uh, welcome the ones that missed the show about physics and quantum and a number of strange things that we had in the morning. Um, everything that will happen in the afternoon is on that website. So, and uh, my name is Nicolas. Uh, what we have in the in the afternoon is well, we have Paul. 50 minutes of Paul McKinney, so be prepared for that. Then we have a brief lightning talk and then uh, parallel programming. So we have an interval and then we have another three sessions about multi-core and FPGAs, Gearman, and discovering inner and parallelism in sequential programs. And immediately after that, we have a panel and birth of a feather that I strongly encourage to stay. And I mean, the panel will be all of us. So ideally, you have people sitting on the front, and then you just pass the microphone. But the idea is to have the same level of communication that we had in the morning. So that's me. That's all here. So you just do this here and there. Thank you. And uh, for, the, for someone who hasn't checked who is this gentleman on my right, he is Distinguished engineer of IBM. He also has the role of CTO Linux, maintains the RCU implementation within the Linux kernel, and a lot of other things that you can read there. And the other thing is that his hobbies include what passes for running at his age, along with the usual housewife and kids' habit. I love the sort of bios that you write for others in third person. So essentially, the most important thing is how people is cynical about himself. And I think that Paul has a master's on that. <laughs> and uh, I probably will speak on behalf of Paul also that uh, feel free to ask meaningful questions. And uh, Even meaningless questions, if they're humorous enough. I say meaningful questions. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I guess I have. And uh, no, and the idea. and. That's my sweet revenge every time that people tell that to me. Don't do statements. Ask questions. All yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> and so I, I'm actually really... Uh, lights? Oh, OK. I'm actually really happy to see the quantum computing in the, in the previous talk. Uh, can anybody guess why it uh, actually feels so good for me? Infinite number of cores, well, I suppose. Uh, actually, the thing is, um, yeah, not missing anything. No, but, <laughs> yeah, there, that's a good but, point. No, but for, for the it's, it's a it's actually a kindness to the viewers. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but the uh, thing is that if we actually do get our heads around this quantum computing stuff, the stuff I've been doing, people have been pointing about, will seem dead simple. All right. So I'm looking forward to that. Anyway, so. Uh, is parallel programming hard? And often that gives you a knee-jerk answer. But if so, why? Why is it hard? I'm going to talk a little bit about my very early experiences with parallelism. I was involved with parallelism before I was involved with computers. Um, talk about, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. Uh, uh, why? I've been doing parallelism for a long time. Why is the excitement now? And uh, some lessons from the past. And, and uh, again, we'll get where we get, and we'll stop when we stop. But again, please ask questions. Um, and uh, I, I want to make sure I'm talking about stuff that's meaningful to you guys. My first experience with uh, large-scale parallelism wasn't a huge number, but it was there. So I'm a teenager in my parents' house, and the doorbell rings. Like a fool, I answer it. And across the threshold come these five things about this tall, all dressed identically, looking identically, just running around the house. And my sister and I were, well, that's, I'm impressed. My sister and I were uh, teenagers, and so the house was not at all childproof. And all of them were running as fast as they could towards something they shouldn't be messing with. And so I, you know, but I can't figure out which one to chase because they're all going somewhere. And about that time, their two, their brother and their sister and their two parents come across the threshold laughing like hyenas watching me. I told them I could fool myself. It was the Anderson Quints. They were making their way down from their home in Washington down to California. And for some reason, they had this very strange aversion to hotels. 
or maybe it was vice versa, I'm not sure. But they were stopping off at friends and friends of friends, and we were in the latter category. And so they apparently uh, got quite a bit of enjoyment out of their uh, first introduction to most of the families they stayed with. They certainly did out of me. The thing was is that they, they were, there were more two-year-olds than there were even if they put the brother and sister together with the parents. And I didn't notice the brother and brother and sister were good kids, but they weren't doing a huge amount of child care. And they seemed, the parents seemed to be able to spawn off threads of consciousness as needed to deal with whatever situation was arising and with five toddlers, uh, situations were arising quite frequently. So, when people tell me that uh, parallel processing is against human nature or against nature or something like that, I remember that experience. It's, uh, you know, uh, and, and it's not like that's the only thing. I and mean, we, we, we saw this, uh, you know, you could think back further in time. <laughs> so we got this uh, guy here who apparently lacks the ability to think concurrently. Um, and, uh, you know, look, Erg, I, yeah, why don't you, I can only one thing at a time, just wait till I'm done. Uh, is he done? Yep, he's done. Now, if only the poor guy can then think concurrently, he might still be alive in the last panel. So I think that uh, one could easily believe that there might be strong evolutionary pressure uh, towards human beings that could deal with concurrency. And, and it's not just a matter of, uh, of the occasional people that have quintuplets or ancient history like this, although I'm not sure how anxious this is sometimes, but some days, but, but whatever. Um, you know, the thing is, it does come naturally to human beings, and uh, there's any number of other situations where it happens, any number of sporting events. Um, American football, I suppose, people look down on football players, and uh, I've been there myself. I, I can't give anybody a hard time for doing that. But uh, the guy on the field, uh, especially the quarterback, is keeping track of 21 other players, plus the referees, maybe coaches as well. Now, I will admit that I've only seen one football player go on to be a parallel programmer. <laughs> on the other hand, uh, that guy was a very t extremely talented parallel programmer. Uh, his name was Jack Slingwine. He's the guy that invented RCU with me. So, you know, it could well be that we've been uh, taking the wrong approach to training parallel programmers. Maybe we should be looking at soccer players or something. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, teacher, teachers have to deal with a classroom of students, more than five usually. Uh, construction, there's a lot of workers doing things, and if they aren't keeping track of each other, people get hurt. Um, I have some friends who have gotten hurt because they fail to keep track of each other, but the injuries are fairly rare. Uh, drivers, uh, lots of cars are keeping track of, and I, when I'm on a bicycle, I hope they're keeping track of bicycle as well, but sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. Air traffic control is another case where there's a lot of concurrency happening. And of course, emergency services, it could be any number of people, depending on what the uh, type of emergency is. So, the fact is that there's been a lot of concurrency and, and tolerance for it throughout human, human history. And uh, we saw this cartoon earlier this morning, same sort of thing. The plants, I'm afraid, are not only non-linearizable, they are moving concurrently. So, you know, it's the, not just the human race, it's the universe. The thing is, just because concurrency comes naturally doesn't mean that concurrent programming comes naturally. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but the, there's some, a key difference there. Concurrency, just reacting to life as it comes along in all its different uh, stages and all its different directions versus writing something that's going to run concurrently and deal with all sorts of things. It's two very different things. So this is what I've done with concurrency, uh, uh, with computers, I should say. I, I left off some of my earlier uh, sporting and other things with concurrency. Uh, some distributed simulation in the late 80s. I worked with, uh, with Sequent doing a parallel Unix kernel in the 90s. A little bit with AIX, and most recently, of course, with Linux. So, you know, I mean, this concurrency has been around even in computers for a long, long time. Why is everybody getting excited about it in the last three or four years? What's changed? Moore's Law stopped. I heard I, there was another thing before that I didn't hear quite. Commodity implementations, Moore Law stopped. Yeah, both of those. Very much so. Um, to an extent. Okay, this is the, you know, the party line. This is kind of a weird graph. Uh, each spot is a uh, Intel CPU. Um, 
and I had to switch from MIPS to, uh, to uh, megahertz at one point just because they stopped using dry stone MIPS. And uh, if you go back further, they use multiple clocks per instruction, so no matter what you do, you, you have a funny graph. But as you can see, you know, at uh, 2003, something bad happened. All of a sudden, the clock frequency didn't go up any faster. That's the party line. Another part is simple economics. I mentioned uh, earlier this morning about carrying a stack of five CPU boards across the parking lot. That's what one of them looked like. Or that's actually an earlier model of one of them. It's got a pair of 3A6 processors on there. Um, it's got a, the, the, the little gold things beside the processors are floating point accelerators. And uh, a stack of five of those was three times the price of my house. As a result, there were just a very tiny number of people that were able to do parallel programming. I worked for a company that produced these things, and there's a couple other people in this room that did as well for that same company. And so that company had to pay us to play with their hardware because otherwise they didn't have any software, and people couldn't make use of their hardware. There were a few universities that got parallel processors, either these ones or other ones. And so some of their students, maybe some of the researchers, could play with them. And there were some companies that bought them and used them that might have a test system setting aside that maybe you could get time on when it wasn't otherwise being used. But these things were so horribly expensive. You know, how expensive? Well, you know, uh, in 1990, if you got a low-cost multiprocessor system, it might only cost you $200,000. 2006, I was working with a grad student who bought a dual-core Mac. The only reason he bought the dual-core Mac was so that he could do a presentation on parallel processing using a parallel processor to drive the presentation. <laughs> so what's happening is that in 16 years, the price of a modest multiprocessor dropped from multiples of the price of a house to a fraction of a used car. And uh, the last five years, it's been dropping still. I mean, you can get for, for way less than uh, 1K, probably, if you're willing to get something fairly basic, you get a multiprocessor for $100 or less. As a result, where before just a few people had the privilege of working with these things, now anybody, I mean, anybody can go buy them and, and use them. You don't have to be, you know, it, these, are, these are, you know, you can get a multiprocessor for the price of taking a modest-sized family out for a nice dinner. Okay, it's, it's gotten down to that point. It's consumer electronics prices. And so what that means is the multiprocessor suddenly can be used anywhere. In 1990, you had to have a really good reason to do parallel processing because it was freaking expensive. Today, well, you could use it on a whim. And so suddenly, there's a lot more demand for parallel systems because they're cheap and, and commodity. And therefore, there's a much larger demand for parallel software because you've got to run something on these things. And therefore, there is a shortage of parallel programmers. This is not the first time that's hap this has happened to this industry, though. Uh, sorry, can I ask you just, I read somewhere that a guy from Intel, Anwar Golum, or can't remember his name, he said a statement about three years ago that only 1% of programmers in the world are able to do parallel programming. Just read it on the blog. I wonder if you agree, disagree, anyone think something about that? Um, I'm, I'm going to get to that in a couple slides. I didn't pay this guy. <laughs> that's a, that is an excellent question. I mean, that's exactly on point. That's the right question to be thinking of. We've been here before. Instead of the great multi-core so, uh, software crisis, we had the great software crisis. In the 1960s, if you wanted a computer at all, it was going to cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars. Around 1970, you could get the little mini computers. They were very small, 4K in memory. Um, you know, tape drives is the only mass storage, model 33 teletype. You might get it for 25K, size of a refrigerator. In the late 1970s, suddenly, you could get small hobby machines based on microprocessors for, again, less than a thousand dollars. I had the good fortune to enter the software market at this time. Uh, I graduated about 1981. And uh, it was fortunate because if you could spell a computer, somebody wanted to hire you. Um, unfortunately, what happened is that everybody was making promises. Uh, we'll use a computer for this. How hard can it be? Um, usually promises they couldn't keep. 
Uh, so uh, I spent about five years in the early 80s keeping people out of jail. This is actually works out really well uh, because uh, people are usually willing to pay fairly well to avoid breaking their contracts or possibly having uh, legal issues. Uh, but uh, the problem really was, again, that there was an acute shortage of programmers. And uh, the thing is, is that this problem somehow got solved. How did it get solved? What happened? As few of you guys have gray hair, you should remember this time. I mean, some of you young guys, I can give you a pass on this, but... Hobbyists. I'm sorry? The hobbyists. The hobbyists? Okay, so what did the hobbyists do that helped? Uh, Obviously, we're playing with and becoming specialists. Well, we yeah. also didn't go after the huge problems that we thought about at the time when we were worried about the crisis. We didn't go after the huge problems that were thought to be really important at the time of the crisis. They did things that people needed to get work done. You know, nobody, I mean, people didn't think about planning a project of a 40 million line code project in the space shuttle software. Right. There was uh, people were doing modest, modest problems that modest programs that weren't 40 million line things that got something useful done that their friends needed that they needed that meant that they could get some useful work out of the computer. Yeah. Yes. And so we raised the level of abstraction in all sorts of ways. You've got four GLs, you've got object oriented, you've got frameworks, you've got toolkits. So we raised the level of abstraction to make it easier for people to solve problems more rapidly to learn how to start solving problems. Okay, so the answer was raising the level of abstraction. Uh, I'm not, I didn't get all of those, but four GLs, uh, object orientation, uh, and a few other ones. Uh, and uh, I agree with half of that, and we'll get to that in a moment. But uh, there's a good thing there. Uh, in the back, or? Okay. All right. And uh, we've been through this, so you guys did really well. Okay. Uh, they become readily available. A lot of people play with them. Uh, a lot of hobbyists. Uh, learn how to program, maybe did think the thing is obvious, or maybe got hired by companies that needed it, and we had useful software. And the same thing's gonna happen with the low-cost low multi-core systems. People will play with them, they'll learn ways to do it, either the ways you've been doing it in the past, or they'll come up with neat new ways, probably some of both, and uh, the problem will be solved eventually. The problem is, is that we're impatient, and we'd like the problem solved today. Uh, preferably yesterday. So, you know, what can we do? Well, one thing to do is to kind of split up, categorize the things that uh, people tried to do just to uh, deal with the uh, great software <laughs> crisis. So there was the thing, uh, it's the good, the fad, and the ugly. All right? So the good, uh, I've got a fairly stiff definition of good here. Although it's actually there are a lot of things that way exceeded this, way exceeded this. Okay, this is actually fairly modest for what really happened in the best case. But you need an order of magnitude improvement in productivity, or an order of magnitude increase in the number of people able to use the machine, and in many cases multiple orders of magnitude in both at the same time. This happened a lot in the 80s. Uh, we have the fad, which is that there was a lot of excitement at the time, but um, I mean, uh, well, if you want to get Barbara Liskoff really mad at you, uh, tell her that you really appreciate how much her work influenced C++, all right? <laughs> uh, just, you know, I actually did that, uh, suggest not doing it, yes? I just want to remind you, Bertrand Meyer has this line about how uh, the first object oriented paper simulator was such an improvement on all its successes. <laughs> <laughs> simula? Uh, you simula? simula? Yeah, simula. Yeah, the, the yeah, Ada was, uh, Simula was actually in the 60s and 70s was when it started. Ada was in the, in the 80s. But the, um, uh, Gareth Strustrup tells a story about talking to, uh, I think it was Christian Nygaard. There's, I can't remember the name of the other guy. But there were, there were two, two guys behind Simula. And, uh, and Gareth was wondering, you know, well, how does it feel to, to come up with inheritance? And the guy said, he said well, I, I'm not going to try to emulate the Norwegian accent. I, I'm sorry. I, 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 you lose a lot by not doing it, but on the other hand, you probably lose more if I tried it, okay? Um, so, he says, well, it was, it was like that Greek guy, you know, that leapt out of the bathtub, he's yelling Eureka, and ran down the street, you know, naked. Except that, well, us, us uh, we, don't, we don't run down the street naked in this country, and besides, it was winter, and uh, that would have been a bad idea. So, but, but yeah, the, 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 uh, 
so there were, there were a lot of things. There were a lot of things at the time that were going to save the world, that were high-minded things that were going to make a really big difference that you know, people probably don't even recognize anymore. The third category was the ugly. It was in use then, it's still in use now, and it's just too freaking ugly to die. And it's also T-O-O for ugly, ugly, ugly to die, as opposed to just T-O ugly to die. I'll, I'll fix that later. Uh, uh, things like C, C++. Uh, C++ actually came a little bit later. Uh, Fortran is finally, I think, sort of dying, maybe, but uh, it's hard to say. Uh, you know, uh, COBOL is still in use a lot, although I don't think there's that much new code in it. Anyway, um, I'm not going to try to predict. Uh, I have some opinions, but uh, I guess uh, the mission for you, if you choose to accept, if you really want to be part of this, is to figure out what you can do that would show up in the top category, or potentially in the bottom one, and avoid the middle. Remember. Or what you can achieve. Or what you can achieve. Yeah. But I bet. I bet we can get some stuff from Olicore in that top category. I bet it's the things that people aren't really thinking that much about, and I suspect that it'll probably be some guy in a garage that just does it because it seemed like a bizarre thing to do at the time. But the things do exist. They're out there. I just don't know what they are myself. So that, this is my opinion of what the great software crisis was, and uh, you can come up with any number of people and get a good argument going on it, I'm sure. But uh, the, for, the, for the biggest one was a spreadsheet. And that was a higher level of abstraction. I don't know if you've ever tried to do a paper and pencil spreadsheet, but that used to be the, what people really did. Either that or chalkboard, right? They do these, and they'd have arithmetic errors, and they have to go back and fix them. And if you want to adjust something, you have to, you know. And it wasn't Xerox wasn't that great at the time. It was more uh, mimeographs and things like that, and it was it was painful. A spreadsheet meant you could just put the stuff in there, you get the answer immediately. You want to change something, change it. You can save off as many copies as you want with slightly different things, and it was just great. Of course. Um, there's some spreadsheets that look like they, the success was its own undoing, but uh, uh, you can use, misuse any tool, and spreadsheets are any tool. Presentation manager and the word processor. I mean, the thing is, both of these things I didn't think much of at the time. I mean, it's kind of like, yeah, a spreadsheet, you know, you know that's not, I, I, I didn't think any of it, and, and I really didn't think any of it was presentation manager and the word processor, not much either, right? But those are the things that really made the difference. Those are the things that really made it so that the computer was something that my grandparents used. If you'd have told me in the mid-70s that my grandparents would use a computer, I would have laughed at you. I mean, that's the most polite thing I can imagine doing, all right? Yet, because of those things, you know, by the time the uh, early 80s came around, they were using computers. Uh, Computer-aided engineering was another big one. Uh, what it meant, uh, there's, a, there's a guy that, uh, was uh, in charge of the labs at SRI when I worked there. His son got into uh, computer engineering. This was in the mid to late 80s. And he wanted to get a summer job. And they had a uh, company draftsman. So they went and applied. And they wanted him to do it on the table with paper and pencil. And he goes, well, you know, that's not really going to work for me. I, I need to do this on the computer. Except that his computer, that you know, portable computer, meant you could, like, I don't know what, and you could put it in the back of a pickup truck or something at that time. And so he, his computer had to stay at home. And they went back and forth on that. They weren't comfortable at all having this guy who was just barely out of his teens working at home um, doing stuff that, that they were going to depend on. So they went back and forth and eventually agreed that he could come in on Monday and show them what, they, what he'd done the previous week, and they would just see how things went. And if that didn't work out, then they'd be back to the drafting board for him. So they gave him his assignments. He came back in the next Monday with all the work done. So basically, they had taken what they felt was a summer's worth of work and handed it to him. And because of the computer and, and computer <coughs> engineering, which again isn't all that high-minded, he was able to get all that done. Actually, it turned out in a weekend, two days. So that's a couple orders of magnitude. All right. And uh, a lot of the guys uh, in engineering were, wouldn't have been able to use a computer in the 70s and had no problem in the 80s with that kind of software. I suppose we could have a lot of fun going through uh, picking on the various fads. Uh, I'm not sure as how worthwhile it is, but uh, there were just any number of things that were going to save the world that uh, you probably can't even find on Wikipedia anymore. The ugly uh, C language, set, awk, Perl, Visual Basic. Yeah. Nothing's wrong with it. It's ugly. It's good. We use it. I mean, it, it's. 
it's just too ugly to die, and it's it's useful. I mean, it's, it, so there was a, there was actually there was actually a, a computer a computer software crisis before. This is the first one I lived through uh, when I was around to know what was going on. There was one that happened about 20 or 30 years earlier. Okay, and it started off because computers were available at all. And I don't know if I never have been able to track down whether the story is, is true or not, but it's it, it deserves to be true even if it's not. All right. So uh, a number of organizations, including the US military, were having a heck of a time because you know, how are you going to get an experienced programmer when you've got, just got the first computers and there haven't been any before, right? It's not a matter of them being cheap and expensive. It's a matter of them existing at all. Well, the military being what they were, they got a bunch of their research psychologists on the job. And uh, after a bunch of testing and questionnaires and all that, they found there were two classes of people who could be reliably trained to program. Only two classes. Anybody care to guess those two classes? Go for it. Engineers and mathematicians. Uh, what was that again? Engineers. Engineers and mathematicians. mathematicians. You're close on one and missed violently on the other one, but we'll, we'll, that's not bad. For a, that's, that's actually pretty good. Any other guesses? Psychologists. Psychologists. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> that would have been, been classic, but it uh, didn't work out that way. I, I like that answer, though. Football players. Accountants. Uh, not a chance. Sorry. Mental patients. Well, I guess that describes all of us, I suppose. But, uh, <laughs> Kids. Kids. Um, I, you know, the Army wasn't, uh, I don't think that was part of their test. It would have been interesting if they died. I don't think they thought of that at the time. Any other guesses? Football players. Football players. <laughs> well, like I said, I only know one, the one football player who went on to be a parallel programmer. I'm sure there are others. That's just the one I want to know. Okay, so engineer was close. Um, math mechanics was one of the classes. Guys that like fix engines and stuff like that. Work on, you know, troop carriers or whatever. Any any last minute guesses for the second group? Cooks. Cooks. That's an interesting one. I wouldn't have thought of that. Uh, they they were more they would more align with chemistry. One of the things they would ask women when they for the war effort, do you prefer knitting or sewing on the one hand or cooking on the other hand? The, guys, the ones that like knitting and sewing got sent off to do ele build electronic equipment. The ones that like cooking got sent off to do chemistry. Musicians. Very good, exactly. Exactly, musicians. And you know, I think that all the religious wars we have in computers today are between those two groups, mechanics and musicians. But those were the, those were the two groups, mechanics and musicians, that uh, the, uh, the U.S. military was able to reliably train to produce software in the 50s. I thought instead of mathematicians and musicians were actually one group. Possibly. Um, but uh, that's, that's I, wasn't, I wasn't there at the time. You might be right. I don't know. But that's what, I'm telling you the story as I heard it. There is a lot of mathematics in music. I think the, I think the difference is that um, musicians are into creating something, which you have to do programming. Mathematicians are more into an analysis, which is okay if the program already exists, is kind of my experience. I, whether that has anything to do with reality or not is an excellent question I don't know the answer to. So, again, we're going to have the same three sorts of things. And a lot of things, I think, are the good side. The, the, the thing about those things on the good side is they're very close to the application level. The things that turned out to be fad were mostly low-level things. I mean, they, they, they were you know, high-level. You've got to keep in mind that at this time, C was a high-level language. Okay, uh, To be a low-level language, you had to be assembly. And that's kind of changed now. C is a low-level language. It's, it's, it's a lot higher level now than it was then. But it's, you know, I don't know. Anyway, I suspect that a lot of the things that are really going to make it so that ordinary people can use multi-core computers are going to be things kind of like that. Um, in fact, I think there was a, I can't remember which periodical it was, but they had an interview of the guys that parallelized Adobe Photoshop. Okay? And you can do the same thing presumably again, but at that point, the people using it don't know or care that it's running in parallel. Just like the guys using a spreadsheet don't know or care what algorithm it's using to propagate the values as long as it does so. So I think that kind of thing is going to be the big deal. So I said earlier, that concurrency is natural for human beings. Concurrent programming might not be. So what's hard about programming? Why is programming hard? Why can't, you know, it's, a lot of people can't do it very well. 
Now, you can argue that even the people of those of who are best at it can't do it very well. But there's a lot of people who really can't do it very well. Yeah? Because it's kind of human thing, so when you're telling a human what to do, you sort of assume the human's able to think about some things for themselves. Okay. Yeah, so uh, if you're going to do a computer program, you better plan for all the contingencies, otherwise you got a bug. Whereas if you're doing something yourself or you're telling somebody else to do it, you can, assuming they, under, assuming they understand what the heck you're supposed to do, um, you should be able to give something very general instructions or some general kind of a wish, not a plan, and get it done. That's certainly one of them. Yeah? Uh, there was a, linking this with the previous one about Large amount of short-term memory. Okay. It's able to hold a lot of information for a short period of time. Okay. Yeah? Breaking problem down into pieces that are small and not too small. And that, yeah, that ties in with the planning. Um, in fact, uh, my first hint that my oldest daughter might be good at programming, she actually is doing entomology, real bugs as opposed to design bugs. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in third grade, they had her do a you know, tell me how to make a peanut butter sandwich, write down the steps for making a peanut butter sandwich. And a typical kid will say, you know, put a piece of bread down, put the peanut butter on the bread, put the jelly on the bread, and then put another piece of bread on top, at which point you've got pieces of bread with a chars of jelly and peanut butter in between them. Uh, she did 38 steps. Okay. So there's, there's a lot to that, yeah? There. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, doing programming often requires a much more detailed view of the problem, a lot deeper analysis of what's needed in a lot more cases. Okay, so um, these are all hitting on... Uh, what, what I did to try to get this out was I, I talked to people who had tried programming, were able to do it, but didn't like it. And, you know, talked to about through the reasons why they didn't like it, and came up with these three. And we've, we've mostly been talking about one of them. Uh, the last one. Which is that people expect to be successful despite fragmentary and incomplete plans. In other words, not enough detail, uh, not having a human being to interpret the higher level stuff, and several other aspects of that that would come up, which are quite an safe cycle. Yeah, I think that's the most important one. The other two are that uh, people expect that there's something intelligent that is going to have common sense. And, uh, well, there are some things, that, uh, some embedded things that seem to be getting there to some extent, but uh, usually that isn't happening with a computer. In fact, most of the time they put, portray them as tools because people don't expect tools to have common sense as opposed to another person. They also expect intelligent beings to understand their intent. And we may get there at some point with artificial intelligence, but they've been promising that for, what, 50 years now, so I'm not holding my breath. And so the thing is, though, and so those are the big three that I've thought of, and, and there were a lot of variations as far as I can tell in the last one. Most of this has not much to do with parallelism, with one exception. That's actually the one you guys talked about. If you're doing things in parallel, it puts even more stress on your planning. All right? Because uh, things like deadlocks, if you think of them, are failures to plan. I mean, they're annoying, and, and uh, you'd like not to have to plan to that degree. But if you have a deadlock, it's because you didn't plan for the case of two people trying to acquire the locks in the opposite direction. So more planning is required, and therefore um, there's some additional difficulty with parallel programming. But it's, uh, as near as I can tell, fairly small compared to getting to programming in the first place. I'm not going to go through this uh, in too much detail. Um, uh, the, the, this just talks about the reasons. I think you understand them because of the things we went through. Um, Eliza is actually an early counterexample. Uh, 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 Feigenbaum's, if I got the name right, uh, little uh, sort of therapy session program that uh, was very simple yet uh, passed the Turing test with a lot of people. 
but uh, uh, in most cases, yeah, you don't try. Anyway, the solution, by the way, on the planning is to let the computer do the planning. Inside the Linux kernel, there's a fair amount of that already. Things like lockdep are very helpful. I mean, they're a pain in the rear sometimes because they make you plan when you don't think you have to, but they help. Um, and uh, various of the performance analysis tools help as well in being able to look at what's going on and, and work things out. There's also some of the uh, theorem proving systems, problem and things like that that can help analyze a plan. But I think that in a lot of cases, uh, increasing the ability of the tools will help out as we go forward. So okay, how, this, how, we've talked about how you can get in trouble, how can you succeed? And there's a lot of ways, I'm not going to go through all of them, or any, even a large fraction of them. Uh, what's happened in the two organizations I've been involved in that have done parallel programming has been an apprenticeship approach, both at Sequent and also in the Linux community. You surround people that uh, come in that don't know about parallel programming with people that do. You provide them quick feedback on what they're doing that's wrong and what they should do instead. And uh, really quickly, at SQL, within a couple of months, we'd have people that were writing competent parallel pro code. It was just a matter of, you know, you do it this way, kind of a thing. One of the things that we have now that we didn't have then is a huge number of open source projects that have parallel code. And that means that people can learn from those uh, without having to be in a place where there's a code base. That'd be in, the, in the 90s, almost all the parallel code bases were proprietary. If you want to learn about parallel code by looking at a code base, you had to work for the company that produced it. And you learn about that one code base only. And today we've got a ton of them out there, and it should be possible to learn fairly quickly. If you are looking to take an existing sequential program and parallelize it, I would suggest picking the open source project that most closely matches what your program is doing. The techniques are most likely to match what you're doing better. There's been a lot about embarrassing parallelism. How about it's trivial? I was on a phone call with a gentleman who will go nameless, um, and I was, uh, he was having a problem with parallelism, and I suggested just taking and using the shell script ampersand thing, just, you know, run the program a bunch of times with different inputs, and, and he got really upset with me. That's not parallelism! <laughs> it's parallel to me. Well, people do that, they'll call us those parallel programs, they get in trouble. Well, yeah, people get in trouble anyway. I, I, I couldn't convince him, he was just, <laughs> he's very angry and upset, I don't know. The last one's probably the most important, and that's taking validation seriously. Uh, as we saw, parallel programming has more cases where you have to plan more carefully, and therefore your validation is going to have to be more stringent. Um, and that may mean you have to take your serial validation and get it up to speed, get it be more vicious, find a lot of the bugs that are probably hiding because people avoid them, and uh, get to the point where you have a chance of having validation system that's going to be equal to the task of dealing with parallel systems. One thing that uh, Sequin got lucky with by accident, our first piece of hardware before my time, this was in 1983, I joined in 1990, turned out to support uh, 30 CPUs. So they started doing for 32 CPUs, 30 CPUs from the get-go. As a result, they designed for that, and they happened to have a guy named Bob Beck who was one of the few people who was able to just sort of intuit parallel program and get it right. I don't count myself in that. And as a result, they were able to do the job once and have it running at 30 CPUs. The experience in most other places has been, okay, we got it running on one CPU, let's do two. Okay, um, three, four, and you end up oftentimes having to rewrite it. Now, yeah. As a fellow traveler, I will say the most critical decision was deciding at the beginning not to put a big kernel lock in and say, we're going to do the hardware, and we will walk through every single routine, every single thing, and do the parallelism once. Yeah, so the, so the uh, yeah, well, Steve actually joined Sequin before I did. Was it two years before or something like yeah. that? Uh, and, uh, yeah, the, the uh, I'm not sure if the documents are public, but the documents on it, they, they went through that and talked about that as a possibility and rejected it because they needed to get to 30 processors and they knew they couldn't make 30 processors if they did that, and so they didn't. Uh, so yeah, that's, in any case, if you, if you decide what your target is up front, you can get there in one step um, instead of having to go multiple times. Actually, what the Linux community has done has worked out fairly well because we're able to throw a large number of people at it and just recover from that sort of thing. You need to have a solid core of experienced engineers. 
um, somebody who's done parallel programming or has access to it. You really don't want people who don't know anything about it trying to mentor people who don't know anything about it. They better have access to parallel hardware. That's not a big deal today, but it used to be. And they need to understand what it can do and what works well and what doesn't with it. One uh, thing, they need to have access to all the source code. The reason is that there's a lot of problems you run into with parallelism that are distributed throughout the source base. So you have a deadlock, for example, that goes through all, a whole pile of components and comes back around to the start. If you don't have access to those old source, you're going to have a tough time debugging that. This is one of the reasons why the Linux community doesn't like binary modules much. Um, it's also the reason why Microsoft is willing to do Windows Vista to themselves. They kicked almost all their device drivers out to user land in order to avoid this problem. The other thing you need to do is make sure the team you have can deliver decent software. Uh, and we'll get to that a little bit if, uh, if we have time. But I'm just going to go through some patterns that have worked out well in the past. Uh, this is a classic one. You have a database or something like that, so, uh, some other piece of software. You write single threaded code that talks to it, and all the parallelism is handled off in somebody else's stuff. Works really well, uh, and it's been used a lot, and, and you shouldn't be ashamed to use it. Uh, you can have, go ahead. Oh. Uh, yeah, well, if there's somebody who's capable of hand taking the buck and they're willing to do it, that's not a problem. Do you use a compiler? <coughs> hmm? Do you use a compiler? Yeah. yeah. No, it's uh, some, sometimes it's fun and sometimes useful to just do something the hard way for, for doing it. But if your job, if your idea is just to get the job done, um, passing the buck where if there's somebody willing to take it is a, is a good thing. This doesn't have to be a separate program. Uh, Samba, I believe, uses something called TDB, which is an in-memory database. And they use that as kind of their center of parallelism with memory mapping, if I remember correctly. Another one is, uh, this is this is the one the guy got upset at me on the phone. Just take and whack it into pieces and, and you know, do each piece separately and combine the results at the end. Really simple, but it works. And uh, if I hit the right button, maybe I can go to the next slide. And MapReduce is sort of like this. It has a little more structure to it, but it's the same basic idea, but with some infrastructure to do this spreading out and the gathering together for you. This is the one I think people forget, and it's really important. Parallelism is at its heart a performance optimization. If your application runs fast enough on a single processor, why not just let it be single-threaded? I mean, if it's fast enough, it's fast enough. So I'm not going to go through this in detail, but uh, just different ways you can partition things. We'll take a look at traps and pitfalls. And yes, sequential code has traps and pitfalls too, but what ones are specific to parallelism? So uh, let's start with the first one here, single-threaded code and so on. The thing is that there's a lot of things that are cheap and easy for single-threaded code. For example, singleton patterns. Uh, you can have global counters or monitors, uh, sort of like the big kernel lock that Steve mentioned earlier, and uh, global transaction IDs. These things are just cheap as dirt for certain code. You can put them in your API, pass them up and down, everybody's happy. Uh, but you try to do that in parallel, and suddenly you got this one bottleneck, this, this global thing that's, that's causing you trouble. Ordering guarantees, sometimes you can't avoid them, but if you can, you, sh you might want to because the less coordination you have to have between different pieces, the less communication you have, the better your performance and scalability. Uh, global locks, again, um, and uh, I talked about uh, strongly the non-community this morning. It's still a problem this afternoon. The thing is, is that these work great for sequential code. They're often very expensive for parallel code. And if you want to get to tens of processors, you might have problems with it. What this means isn't that you should give up necessarily. If you need your single-threaded CPU to go faster, your single-threaded application to go faster, go ahead and make the change. Just understand these are big animal changes you are likely to have to do some serious rework on your application, some rip and replace. You might not have to. You may be able to just replicate the thing and, and split things up, but if it's not simple, it's going to be tough. So if you've got a sequential project right now, you've probably got people working on it. They might not know anything about parallel software, although as time goes by, it's becoming more and more in the, in the culture, so it'll be less and less of a problem getting people who can do that. You might be able to get an experienced parallel programmer, and then you need readily available hardware, 
access the software and so on. But what do you do if you can't get an experienced parallel programmer? Yeah. Uh, give up there. Give up there? That's, if, if you're, again, if it's fast enough uh, sequentially, that's great. Or you can, you know, uh, may, it could be somebody else's problem, and thus have your people do the part that's sequential. Classes are becoming available. You can actually get decent classes in some places. It's, and the problem is I can't really be the judge. I didn't learn this stuff in a class room. I learned it from a logic analyzer hooked up to a symmetry. All right? But there seem to be people getting something out of the classes. I can't tell you which ones are which, but ask people have gone through them recently. And again, there's just a lot of open source projects out there that do parallel, and you can go and inspect those and learn from them. Um, watch out for license compatibility, of course. This is the most important lesson. If you have only one of something, you're going to have all your CPUs trying to get through this door, and there's going to be a big line and a big pile up. It's going to be ugly. On the other hand, if you split things up, you just partition things well, you won't have much queuing. Things will go fast, and life will be relatively good. Anyway, we're getting towards the end of this. Uh, let me, um, yeah, if you have uh, one, this is, this is worth talking about. One of the things that happens if you have a long-lived project, um, especially if it's for a given purpose at the application level, you get people that are working on the thing and they move on to something else. You're left with people who are maintaining it. It's kind of like a building. Initially, when you build a building, you got architects, you got construction engineers, you got all sorts of people putting things together. And eventually, you got janitors taking care of it. So, if you've had a software project that's been in existence for a long time and the guys that wrote it have gone away, you need to ask yourself whether your current people are really up to making a big animal change like introducing parallelism. If they aren't, you may need to make some adjustments. So yeah, we went through this in the, in the morning. It's just important in the afternoon. How far should you take parallelism? Well, it depends. The further up the stack you are, the more you care about productivity again. The further down the stack you are, the more about performance and generality. So in the Linux kernel, we can afford to put a huge amount of time and effort into fairly small performance gains because they benefit everybody. If you're an application with only a few users, you have to be much more careful about how, what you invest in. And you want a lot more higher level tools to be able to get it done quickly. Anyway, I think that's the, a good place to end this. Uh, if there are more questions, we can take them. Uh, is the floor feeling that he answered the question that he presented to himself? Is parallel programming hard? And if so, why? Yeah, what is the answer? <laughs> I have one comment, which... So one of the things that a lot of parallel people seem to kind of brush under the, the carpet completely is that a lot of problems aren't parallel. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that is something that is, people is, have is, a hard time just facing and admitting. And they, it seems to be a, a general problem when you, you then tell them, hey, I'm sorry, my problem is chasing pointers. You can throw 16 CPUs at it. And, and a lot of people actually can. <laughs> you can do it by doing a lot of speculation and throwing energy at it, yes. Uh, a lot of people seem to have trouble admitting that sometimes uh -huh. I, I'm, you I'm, are just going to be sequential and have dependencies. I'll make a deal with you, Linus. If you ever see a patch from me that attempts to paralyze pthread mutex lock on a single, on a single lock, um, it's time for me to stop. <laughs> No, it's, uh, some things are more parallel than others. Sometimes you can think about them differently and recast them. There's a dithering. Uh, there was this dithering algorithm a while back that involved uh, kind of taking things together in strange ways, and it was felt that it was, you couldn't parallelize it because it, there wasn't any way to run down the thing either way that, that got rid of the dependencies. Some kid in college in the, uh, oh, it's the 2000s sometime, uh, realized that you could just look at the thing diagonally and the dependencies went away and uh, became parallel. Now, it turns out that a lot of other dithering algorithms don't have that property, and you're stuck. But uh, uh, again, uh, parallelism is a performance optimization. Like any other optimization, there's some places it applies and some places it doesn't. Yeah, getting a woman having a child in less than nine months is hard. Even if you had nine women, that's a silly joke. But well, the no, point no, is... The thing is, it depends on whether you want a human child or not. 
if you're, <laughs> if, if, if you're whirling with birds, other kinds of mammals, it can be quite a bit shorter. But I never learn. I can't die. With this guy. <laughs> so, gentlemen, any other question, please? What I've often found when trying to parallelize systems, though, is that the inter-process inter communication overheads more than often exceed the benefits to be gained through the parallelism. Because mm -hmm. IPC is still incredibly expensive. Mm -hmm. Memory access is incredibly expensive. And, uh, so, so what's really happening to try and address some of those issues? So one of the things that I, that's a really good thing is the, the quote from this morning on from uh, Dr. Patterson where he was realizing, he, he was the guy that had the 13 dwarfs, was it? Where he had these little computational kernels he wanted to parallelize. And uh, he's recently realized that what you need to do is take as big a chunk as you can and parallelize that. Because um, a lot of times, if you take a big chunk and cut it out, you'll have more computation for a given amount of communication. That doesn't always work that way. Uh, I mean, nothing works all the time for everything. But uh, that's one thing to try, or one thing that may work. Just about development practices, you highlighted uh, mentoring, pairing experience with inexperienced programmers, everybody having access to the code and being able to refactor it. That's two out of the list of extreme programming, isn't it? Um, any comments on programming practice? Uh, do the strategies that you've seen working for parallelism work for development in general in your experience? You know, it's been, it's been so long since I've done sequential programming uh, <laughs> commercially that I'd be hard-pressed to know. Um, I, think, I think there's a lot to be said for that. I was thinking in terms, with pair programming, what you have is you have people uh, of more or less, you know, some often equal capabilities, maybe different viewpoints, working together on a, pro a problem. And that's a useful thing, I think, regardless. Uh, what I'm thinking is a little bit different, where you have somebody who's new and doesn't understand things, being surrounded by people who will give them quick feedback on what they need to do. Not on that it's broke, but on, OK, do it this way and it'll be better. Uh, and that often people really quickly uh, react well to that. Um, sorry, I just want to say thank you for your time. I hope that you will be at 5 at the panel. And then we will continue taking questions later. But then we can continue with the program and give the opportunity to everyone else. So join me. Thank you very much, Paul, for having me. Thank you.